Hello, David. Hello there. How are you today? Very good. And it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I really love just chatting with people about uh, stuff I enjoy chatting about. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to remind everybody that you're a, a A-house author and you're a teacher, um, internationally renowned. And you used to work for a, a huge, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies as a scientist, weren't That's you? Right. And then you resigned from it in 99. Yes. And, and something happened there. Could you tell us? that shift, what was that shift about for you? Yeah, I had been, I was working, my, my, my training was as an organic chemist. Now what an organic chemist does, this is during my PhD, is you take atoms and you stick them together in a particular way to build up a molecule which becomes the actual drug, the little white tablet that you yeah. take or the, the liquid that you get injected. That contains all the molecules and stuff. And I, I trained in building up those things atom by atom. But when you prove that a drug works, you have to compare it against a fake drug. And many, most people know that a fake drug is called a placebo. So now I worked in cardiovascular drugs, in building cardiovascular, that's drugs for the heart. And they tend to have quite a high placebo effect. So what I kept seeing time and time again is when you had a drug that was perhaps 80% effective, it wasn't uncommon to have the placebo being 60 to 70% effective. And that's purely because people believed or thought they were getting the drugs. Wow. And for me, I couldn't let that go. That was far too interesting for me. And I was much more interested in that than in actually making the drugs. So I, that's why one of the reasons, the main reason actually, why I resigned. Because I thought, wouldn't it be great if people could learn to tap into that latent capacity that they have to heal the bodies using the mind. I mean, the mind, I think, is the, the plug that we use to tap into this current of, of wellness in the body. So my research since then has been, how do we tap into that? What are the states of mind or attitude? What are the ways of thinking that can do that? These are all the, the things that were inspiring me when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I actually couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> Yeah, exciting. Such an exciting quest. So, so what kind yeah. of research did you do? Did you get some scientific proof, actually, that the mind has an effect on the body and can heal? Oh, yeah. Do you know, there are thousands of published scientific reports in the medical journals, in the neuroscience journals, in the pharmacology journals. And one of the first things I did was I went to a university library and I spent months in the medical library looking through initially all the scientific published reports on the placebo effect mm -hmm. and having my eyes open to the vast number of, the vast amount of data, even scientists showing how does a placebo effect work, you know, comparing a drug against a placebo while you're having your brain scanned with an MRI and noticing in many cases it's exactly the same and it shows that the placebo or your belief in a drug actually accounts for quite a lot of the effect of an actual drug itself. For, for some disease conditions and I was finding all this stuff and it naturally led me into finding evidence for other things, other states of mind like you know how your attitude, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, how that could actually play itself out as adding years to your life. You know how attitudes of even kindness or, or compassion towards people could even protect your heart from damage, from you know damage inflicted by your lifestyles and I started to find stuff on a, how you, you know, the, the, the genetic impact of meditation, you know, what happens when you meditate, what happens to your brain mm -hmm. when you meditate, or even what happens to your brain when you think the same thought repetitively. So if you think the thought, I am such as, I am something, and you think this, I am this thing over and over again, then what actually happens to your brain? So finding all of that research, it was, it was so exciting for me because I couldn't wait to tell people about it and that's why I started writing books on it and really traveling around giving talks and, and lectures. Mm, you're bringing an interesting point about affirmations actually because we can say though something positive but if we feel negative about it, what impact will that have? Yeah, see if we feel negative about something then we're not, we're not congruent with what we're saying. So some of the best things to do is to say something that you would like to, to experience or, or who you wish to be. And if you say that on a regular basis with, with actual meaning, say, mm -hmm. I, you look, I choose this, say it with meaning and say it several times, then incredibly, it actually begins to pattern itself into the brain. Mm -hmm. And the brain actually forms connections. Like, we have like 100 billion brain cells called neurons. 
and they actually look like a little square that's been sucked in. So imagine you've got a little square, and you, you know, that's not quite a square, but a square. <laughs> and a square, go, a square goes, and it sucks itself in. So you end up with a wee thing that, like a wee sucked in square. And in each of these corners have, lo- have thousands of little tentacles. And they reach out to touch the tentacles of neighboring squares. And the squares are actually brain cells or neurons. So as the, the neurons begin to connect with each other on account of what you're saying, on account of the thoughts that you think. So if you, th- if you say the same thing, like, uh, I am a worthy person, for example, and say it many, many times with meaning every single day, then you begin to form connections, these connections between the brain cells, thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands upon millions of these tentacles begin to reach out and connect with each other purely because you are saying, I am a worthy person, I am a worthy person. So this sense of worthiness becomes embedded structurally into the the fibers of the brain. So you now have physically changed your brain and all you've really done is say something that you choose to believe on a regular basis. So is that neuroplasticity? How do you define neuroplasticity? That's exactly what it is. Neuroplasticity is... It goes against the the old concept we had of the brain, that the brain was a hardwired thing. When I was was at university, we were taught a model of the brain, like, uh, it's like, as you grow up towards your teenage years, the brain is like dough, soft before you, uh, you can knead dough before you put it in the oven to make bread. But once you get to about 16 years old, you put the dough in the oven and it comes out with a crust on it. And, and the analogy is that the brain is like that. It's moldable until you get to maybe teenage years and then it becomes hardwired. But that model of the brain has been completely thrown out. And we now understand that the, you, never put the bread in, you never put the dough in the oven. The brain is actually changing, moldable, to the last seconds of your life, to your last breath. These neural connections that are forming between brain cells, these tentacles reaching out and touching, you're actually growing new tentacles all the time. It's not just existing ones touching each other. We grow brand new tentacles purely on account of what we pay attention to in our lives. So that's neuroplasticity. It's the ability the brain has to literally rewire and construct itself around the thoughts that you think, around the movements that you make and the life experiences you have, and even the things that you tell yourself on a regular basis. So what's the impact then on, on, on illness? What you're it will. See, see if a person is able to tell themselves, I am in recovery, I am in recovery, I am getting better, compared to saying, I am sick, I am sick nothing works for me, then the person saying, I am in recovery, I am in recovery, I am in recovery, will actually be causing changes in the chemistry of their brain. And not only that, causing structural changes to the connections in the brain, which might overall tilt the body in the direction of well-being relative to moving the body in the direction of sickness. And I've noticed time and time again that one of the factors that that characterize people who have made tremendous recoveries from life-threatening conditions who've really defeated, them, really defeated the medical odds, have had that attitude. I will make this. I will get through this. I am in recovery. I am getting better. Every single day, I am getting better. And it's this conviction of, of repetition of the positive statements that they make is one of the key factors that I've seen in just about everyone who's defied the medical odds. Mm. But, but still using the medicine or you think we can just heal our body by ourselves? Oh, no. Do you know, I always say to people that, that why don't we do both? Why don't we use all that medicine, whether that's conventional medicine or whether that's alternative medicine, why don't we use all that we have at our disposal? Follow, follow the best advice you can possibly get, but use your mind as well. I mean, I often say to people, you have all this, you have people who can help you around yourself, so use all of that, but use your mind in addition to you don't have to be one or the other. Why not use both at the same time? Well, just good, add positive this way, action. That's good because this way at least you didn't piss off the uh, pharmaceutical business and industry and lobbies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have no intentions of making any enemies or, or making someone else wrong so that I have to, so that I can be right. Yeah. You know, I'm all in favor of using everything yeah. that we could possibly use because there's a lot of great technology out there. There's a lot of great advice and really great doctors and great therapists 
and fantastic people who have the best intents out there. So why don't we supplement that with using our own positive attitude or some visualization techniques or something? So at which level do you think illness starts? Do you know, I, I think there's many, many ways that a person's body can become sick. I mean, for example, people inherit from their, their, their parents or grandparents or their family line some genetic tendencies towards illness. It doesn't mean that you inherit a disease gene, but what most of the time, with the exception of a very small number of genuine genetic disorders, for most conditions what happens is we inherit a tendency you know, so an increased possibility, providing we expose ourselves to the wrong toxins or the wrong environment. So, for example, a person with, who has a family history of heart disease doesn't necessarily mean they have heart disease genes. What that means is the genetics that they have might increase the risk ever so slightly, but to develop heart disease, they would have to be having a very poor lifestyle. They would have to be under a lot of stress or aggressive and hostile as disposition. They would have to be drinking too much, smoking too much, eating too much, too much sugars, fats, all of these things we need to do. So for many people and for many illnesses, the environment that we're exposed to, the foods that we eat, whether that's the right or the wrong foods, the, the toxins, even in our products, you know, some, some, that there's growing evidence for some of the, even the toxins in foods, the pesticide residues in the foods, even a personal cleaning products, beauty products, which might well have a stuff that can have a toxic effect on us. So there's many, many things I think that can cause illness and disease. And the, and the other side of it is attitudes of mind and self-talk can also create illness. And to give you a really good example, one of the fastest ways to develop heart disease in fact, a particular type of heart disease called hardening of the arteries. It's when the arteries move from having the internal consistency of perhaps a poached egg to the internal consistency of plasterboard, you know, kind of hard, chalky calcium. And one of the quickest ways to do that isn't dietary. It's not having heart disease genes. One of the fastest ways to develop heart disease is to be hostile and aggressive towards other people. Yeah. So here you have now an attitude of mind. And there's, there's a great deal of research showing that people with a hostile, aggressive disposition, so they communicate with people in sharp, cutting, aggressive tones, are at much, much higher risk of heart disease, particularly the hardening of the arteries, than other people. And isn't, it, isn't it amazing that as we harden towards people, so we harden on the inside, and the other side of it, as we soften towards people, soften it in our hearts and in our attitudes towards people, so we also soften in our arteries, in our hearts as well. It's one of the most beautiful things that I've ever learned. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like the healing power of love and kindness and, Absolutely. and compassion and, and the, that you speak of. Yeah, the healing power of love and kindness incredibly and, and unsurprisingly actually heals the heart more than anything else. The, the first part of the body to benefit from love, kindness and compassion is the heart. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I mm. love it. Can you tell us about the quantum healing, though? Because the, 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 you're, you're, I've heard yeah. you speaking about illness starting to on a quantum level. Yeah, tell yeah. Tell us more about well, that, what quantum science is and, and, and what kind of qu the quantum field healing that you're referring yeah, well, to. Yeah, well, see, I developed this technique a few years ago called quantum field healing because I had noticed that I had seen some very, very rapid healings. I mean, within two, three seconds. I mean, spontaneous remissions of things very, very quickly. And, and even with the placebo effect, I saw placebo healings take place in a matter of seconds. And I, tried, I started to explore, there must be some mechanism that lies within the body, within reality, that permits such and such a thing. So I created a technique called quantum field healing that would give a person a radical shift in perspective. So, for example, if you had to think of a, a disease, then a person, imagining them, if they had to imagine themselves looking at the disease on the inside of the body, they might see like something like a lump or hard or some form of biology. Can we take the example of, uh, I have rosacea, for example, which is like redness here, there, there. Can we take yeah, that yeah. as an example here? Yeah, so if you were to look, if you were to imagine looking inside that then and see the actual cells themselves, then you would see something clearly physical, clearly physical. And that's most people's perception of an illness or disease is something physical. But here's what, where it gets interesting. 
Because if you had to look inside any one of the cells, imagine you're becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is what my technique quantum field healing is. You become, you imagine your cells becoming smaller and smaller until you're inside the center of the cell where the genetic material lies. So you now, you're now face to face with the DNA or the chromosomes. And you now get smaller and go inside the DNA till we see the atoms. Then you take your mind even smaller until you go inside an atom. And this is where it's fascinating because once you're inside an atom, there's nothing there. In fact, there is 99 point, and get this, there's 99.9999999999% empty space inside of an atom in your body. That's 99 and 13 nines percent empty space inside every atom in your body. Isn't it weird that you're solid? <laughs> yeah. but, but, but this is where, it, this is where quantum field healing has its power. Because now when you look inside a disease, from the physical perspective, it's something solid that seems you know, permanent. But once you get to the quantum field, it's not, there's nothing there at all. It's, it's 99.99% empty space. And what, you actually, and what, what the quantum field really is, it's a sea of waves of energy. So instead, you can look at the particles that make up the quantum field, like the protons and the neutrons and the electrons, and you can think of them instead of being little point particles, you can think of them as being waves of energy. So what you actually have in the quantum field is waves of energy. So now you look at the, the physical disease condition. From the surface perspective, it's something solid and physiological. Once you get to the quantum field, it's waves of energy. And we know intuitively within ourselves that a wave of energy is not permanent. It's very easily changeable. So the shift in perspective is now in the mind. You're no longer seeing something as a physical condition that seems hard to change. You're recognizing that it's purely waves of energy in the quantum field. And what we do with quantum field healing is we impact these waves with our mind by just imagining them changing. And we understand that a wave is easier to change than something physical. So that's quantum field healing is built around doing this with our minds. It's really just it a shift creates, in perspective. It's just right there so much freedom and vibrance within the yeah, cells. Yeah. Like right away there, boom, there. You, you focus on that instead of the, 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 the part that is... Yeah, instead, instead of the, the solid seeming thing that's seemingly permanent, you recognize that it's waves of energy which are not permanent. Waves are always changing and flowing, and therefore this condition will pass. Mm -hmm. this, this, this can pass, and with your mind you help it to pass. Yeah. And it's easier to pass a wave than something solid. And that's where it gets its power. It's the shift in perspective, right? The so, power is all yourself. The power is your own. Mm -hmm. And and we the, the, the resistance, though, creates the, the delay in the recovery, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the resistance to things in our lives can create a delay in recovery. You know, the resistance to even believing that I can't do this or, or telling ourselves that this is how it's going to be for me in the negative sense. You know, telling yourself that I can't possibly get better or, or nothing works for me. All of these kind of things create internal resistance that goes against the affirmations or the visualizations that you're trying to do for yourself. And the best thing to do is enter with an open mind to say, this, I'm willing to believe just for today that this might just work for me. I'm willing to believe just for today that this might just work for me. Mm, that's awesome. So, so you would you say that we can uh, reprogram our DNA and genes and beliefs and everything? Yeah, yeah. You see, what I often I I like to clear something up. When I say to a lot of people, you're, you people assume we're changing our DNA. No, we're not actually changing our DNA fingerprint because a DNA fingerprint is the sequence of genes. So, like you have like a, maybe there's four letters A, C, T, and G. And they all fall in certain sequences in your DNA. So think of them like, you know, like beads on a necklace, colored beads on a necklace. And each person has their own sequence of colors in the beads. And that's your fingerprint. But now instead of thinking, thinking of them as beads, think of them as light bulbs. So I like each of the light bulbs, even though the sequence is the same, the light bulbs can be either on or off. So when you affect your DNA through, you know, determination or affirmation or visualizations or a, an attitude of mind, what you absolutely affect is whether a light bulb is on or whether a light bulb is off. So in other words, we affect whether a gene is on or whether a gene is off. We don't change the fingerprint, we don't change the sequence, 
but we change whether a gene is activated, whether it's on yeah. or whether it's off, and that is incredible power, and that's really the science of epigenetics. It's how not only the environment, but the, the environment of the mind and the heart and the mind, how that can reprogram our DNA by reprogramming whether a gene is on right. or whether a gene is off. And that's what, what a lot of people call junk DNA? Is that So we're actually yeah. using that DNA that a lot of people, I mean, is a big portion that we're not doing anything with. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge now. portion of DNA that, that we don't really know what it's there for, or, or mainstream science doesn't really know what it's there for, and it, we're probably affecting some that as well with attitudes of mind, but no one's really investigated that to the best of my knowledge. But, uh, but what we are affecting is, is the actual genes themselves. When a gene is switched on, it produces a, a peptide, and a peptide is an umbrella term. It can mean it's a protein, or it can mean it's a hormone, or it can mean that it's an enzyme. So when we switch a gene on, we produce a protein or a hormone or an enzyme. And when we switch a gene off with an attitude or mind, perhaps, then we switch off the production of this protein or this hormone or this enzyme. So we're constantly changing the chemistry, the chemical balance and the hormone balance of the body with our minds. We do it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We just don't notice that we're doing it, but it's always going on in, in the background. Whether that, whether there's things happening with junk DNA, you know, I, I don't really know, and I don't think anyone knows that, really knows too much about that, but it wouldn't really matter as long as we know we're changing the gene, putting genes on or putting the genes off with our imagination, yeah. with our minds, then that delivers to us an incredible sense of personal power. We no longer have to feel powerless against situations of against the environment, powerless against our genes, powerless against the disease, because we understand that our mind can impact our cells at the genetic level. Wow, what power does that give you? Your brain, your, your thoughts can activate and deactivate a gene on your DNA. That must give us a sense of hope that surely the mind is far more powerful than we ever imagined it was in the past. And perhaps the only thing that prevented us from using the mind to heal in the past is because we didn't know that we could. Yeah. And now that the evidence is there, we do know that we can. And this is one of the things I'm trying to, to get across and, and through my books and, and through my, my, my lectures and my workshops is, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what are you working now on these days? Hey, I'm, I'm what on is my a secret laboratory, you know. Oh, I, I'm not doing any lab research anymore. What I'm doing is, is going through the medical journals and the neuroscience journals because there's so many new discoveries made every week. I mean, I, I, I use databases of all the scientific papers that have ever been published in medicine, biology, neuroscience, uh, psychology, sociology. And I go through these databases on a weekly basis, and there's always new stuff. And so that gives me an enormous quantity of material that I can use in, in subsequent books. So I've enjoyed, uh, I've, I've enjoyed speaking with, uh, you probably know him, Mario Beauregard. Beauregard. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't know him personally. He's from Canada, a neuroscientist, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know him personally, but I know of, the, I know of yeah. some of the work, yeah. So, so there's incredible new discoveries being made that, that shows us that we have far more power than we thought we had. Amazing. So is there a last thing you want to leave us with or something that we maybe haven't talked about and that you think is really important to point well, out? Well, actually, I have a, my third book comes out in the USA and Canada early in 2011, and it's called Why Kindness is Good for You. And it's a fascinating book that gives you all the scientific evidence for what happens in your brain and what happens in your heart, especially when you say or do something kind, or even think something kind, what happens to your nervous system when you feel compassion? And the reason I wrote the book was to try to inspire people to be more kind, because I, I know it's an overused cliche, but I absolutely believe that kindness can make our world a better place. And my whole reason for writing the book was to provide a fresh approach to kindness, something that people can talk about. Did you realize that kindness benefits your, the hormones in your heart? Kindness causes physical changes in the brain. Compassion stimulates your nervous system and combats the disease-forming agents of cancer and heart disease. And all of this research is in the book. So it's called Why Kindness is Good for You. And, and what I'd like to leave people with is that simple attitude of mind. Be kind. Whenever the, whenever the opportunity arises, do something kind for someone. You know, 
uh, buy someone a present, make someone breakfast in bed, uh, give someone, uh, write a thank you card to a college professor or a teacher who made a difference in your life when you were going through high school. You know, help give give up your seat in the, in the train, give up your seat in the in a, a bus for someone who looks tired. Give someone a hug at random, but just be kind as often as you can. Because when many of us take this attitude courageously of kindness, then I think we really can make the world a better place. Mm, and I love the part where you're really present to that kindness too, like just yeah. not doing it in an automatic way, but really present also. Yeah, be present, be do it on purpose, and that's why I often say yeah. kindness isn't a passive thing. It's not be, it's not just being nice. It's something that you actively do. It takes courage. For many people, it takes courage and it takes presence. Yeah. You know, you have to phys be determined to sometimes push yourself out of your comfort zone yeah. in the service of another person. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And vulnerable. It's vulnerable. Yeah, you have to make yourself vulnerable as well. But there is so much healing that takes place during that. You become whole and the other person becomes whole. And you give them permission to become vulnerable too. And we realize that that's not a sign of weakness, but it's a sign of courage and strength. Because there are few people who have the courage to put themselves in such a position for the service of another person or for, or for the world. Mm, lovely speaking with you. Thank you so much, David. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So my research since then has been, how do we tap into that? What are the states of mind or attitude? What are the ways of thinking that can do that? And these are all the, the things that were inspiring me when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I actually couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> Yeah, exciting. Such an exciting quest. So so what kind yeah. of research did you do? Did you get some scientific proof actually that the mind has an effect on the body and can heal? Oh it? yeah. Do you know what there are thousands of published scientific reports in the medical journals, in the neuroscience journals, in the pharmacology journals. And one of the first things I did was I went to a university library and I spent months Hello David. Hello there, how are you today? Very good, and it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I really love just chatting with people uh, about stuff I enjoy chatting about. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to remind everybody that you're a, a A House author and you're a teacher, um, internationally renowned, and you used to work for a, a huge, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies as a scientist weren't That's you? Right. and then you resigned from it in 99 yes and, and something happened there could you tell us that shift what was that shift about for you yeah I had been in the medical library looking through initially all the scientific published reports on the placebo effect mm -hmm. and having my eyes open to the vast number of the vast amount of data even scientists showing how does a placebo effect work you know comparing a drug against the placebo while you're having your brain scanned with an MRI and noticing in many cases it's exactly the same and it shows that the placebo or your belief in a drug actually accounts for quite a lot of the effect of an actual drug itself right, for, for some disease conditions and I was finding all this stuff and it naturally led me into finding evidence for other things, other states of mind like, you know, how your attitude. What I kept seeing time and time again is when you had a drug that was perhaps 80% effective, it wasn't uncommon to have the placebo being 60 to 70% effective. And that's purely because people believed or thought they were getting the drugs. Wow. And for me, I couldn't let that go. That was far too interesting for me. And I was much more interested in that than in actually making the drugs. So I, that's why one of the reasons, the main reason actually, why I resigned because I thought, wouldn't it be great if people could learn to tap into that latent capacity that they have to heal the bodies using the mind? I mean, the mind, I think, is the, the plug that we use to tap into this current of, of wellness in the body. I was working, my, my, my training was as an organic chemist. Now, what an organic chemist does, this is during my PhD, is you take atoms and you stick them together in a particular way to build up a molecule which becomes the actual drug, the little white tablet that yeah. you take or the, the liquid that you get injected. That contains all the molecules and stuff. And I, I trained in building up those things atom by atom. But when you prove that a drug works, you have to compare it against a fake drug. And many, most people know that a fake drug is called a placebo. 
So now I worked in cardiovascular drugs, uh, building cardiovascular, that's drugs for the heart, and they tend to have quite a high placebo effect. So 